Now it's recording again. Whoa. All right, we all ready? Connor is going to go second. I'll go first. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to Student Health Fair, and thank you for viewing our presentation. Our presentation today is going to be on multiple sclerosis fatigue. My name is Robert Kojal. My name is Alex Connery. And I'm Jacob Saley. So, so, so to start off today, I'm going to do a brief overview of multiple sclerosis pathophysiology. So multiple sclerosis has an unknown cause, but we do know that it is an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system. So it has to do with the brain and then the spinal cord. So in, all immune, in an autoimmune disease, the immune cells are attacking the neurons in the brain. And so that disrupts function of these neurons to send and receive signals in the brain. So it forms the inf these inflammatory lesions and demyelination of axons. So myelin is on axons of neurons to help transmit a smooth signal from the brain to the rest of your body. Without this myelin, then signals cannot be transmitted from the brain to the rest of the body, and that's where problems occur. Um, and then there are formation of plaques, which occurs because of this demyelination, which is the immune cells of the body attacking the myelin in the central nervous system. And they're actually called sclerotic plaques, and what it is is that it is the myelin that is left, that is not functional on the neuron, on the axon of the neuron. And I have a picture to just help describe that. So as you can see, there's um, a, va uh, a capillary with the, the blood brain barrier at the top of the screen. And you can see immune cells passing through the blood brain barrier. The, the immune cells are the purple cells. So immune cells may reactivate and produce cytokines, which recruit more immune cells to cross the blood brain barrier and get into the central nervous system. So these immune cells mount an autoimmune attack against the myelin. The myelin is the yellow part, the yellow rods on the right hand of the screen. And the purple tubing, if you can see it right here, that's the actual neuron. That's the axon of the neuron. So the yellow is the myelin, and it's a myelin sheath protecting the neuron and helping signals be transmitted and transducted. And so when this immune cell attacks the myelin, then the myelin becomes not functional, and that's why the nerve cannot. Um, produce as strong signals, and sometimes it cannot produce signals at all. So this is the steps in multiple sclerosis disease progression. On the left-hand side, you see the original inflammation and demyelination. You see inflammatory cells that are the yellow cells coming in, they cross the, the blood-brain barrier, and they go to attack the myelin of the neuron. On the, on the axon of the neuron. But we do have the oleo, oligodendrocytes, which are producing myelin. And so as the inflammatory cells attack the myelin, these oligodendrocytes are producing more myelin. But the inflammatory cells are working harder than these oligodendrocytes. And so more myelin is being lost than repaired. As the disease progresses, these immune cells will also start to target the oligodendrocytes. And so that will cause loss of these cells that are trying to fix what the immune cells, try, the, these cells, these oligodendrocytes are trying to fix what these immune cells are destroying, which is the myelin. 
So when you have loss of these oligodendrocytes, then it is impaired remyelination. And after that, then just myelin is being lost from attack of the immune cells. And on the right is when it's advanced disease and there's neuronal damage and when so much myelin is lost and there's so much sclerotic plaques present, ner the neuron will die. So multiple sclerosis epidemiology. There are about 2.8 million people in the world with MS, although there may be many more undiagnosed cases. And as we will go further into the presentation, we'll go over what the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is, and it is a very tricky diagnosis. As you can see, there's about 900,000 cases in the United States. It's most prevalent in North America and Europe. Um, in the US, it is more prevalent in the Northeast and the Midwest and less prevalent in the South and the West. And also overall, females are more likely to develop MS and is usually diagnosed between the ages of 20 to 50 and is most common in Caucasians. So there are different types of MS. Um, one type is relapsing remitting MS, where there are symptom flare-ups followed by recovery, and the patient is stable between attacks. So a patient can be have normal neuron signaling and won't feel a thing, and then they'll have an attack, and they might have tingling in their hands or might not be able to control their hands as they would be able to normally. And then that attack will end and they'll go back to normal. Something that can happen is that it can go, it can progress. And when you have progressive multiple sclerosis, either in secondary or primary, this is when there are not relapse, when there are not times in between attacks. And so, and so symptoms of multiple sclerosis are always present. They do not go away. And as you can see, there are multiple different types of MS, including benign, progressive relapsing, and also malignant or fulminant, which is the most serious case and the most detrimental case, whereas rapidly progressive disease course. So I'm going to start by talking about MS diagnostic tools, and MS diagnosis is really a diagnosis of exclusion. And so there's no definitive signs, symptoms, or lab findings that you can singularly use to pinpoint that the patient is suffering from MS. And the criteria for diagnosis usually involves medical history, a neurologic exam, an MRI, a spinal fluid analysis, and a blood test. And they're looking for evidence of damage in two or more different locations of the CNS. And they're looking for evidence that the damage occurred at separate times, as well as trying to rule out other causes. So MS symptoms, there's a wide variety of them, but fatigue or lassitude is the highest at 89.6%. So the vast majority of patients who are experiencing MS will experience fatigue. Mobility issues are also pretty common. Numbness and tingling is very common. Pain is common. Muscular spasms are common. Depression is, is pretty up there, 54%, and emotional changes are common as well. So now we're going to get more specifically into multiple sclerosis fatigue. It's one of the most common symptoms of multiple sclerosis, and it can occur because of the high disease burden, as well as the high psychological burden of the disease. It can be one of the most prominent symptoms and can force those affected to prematurely leave the workforce, and it can vastly decrease quality of life. If you're really sleepy, it's hard to work. It's hard to get done where you need to get done. It's hard to live a life that you like. And there are several different types of fatigue that can occur based on the cause of that fatigue. So the symptoms of multiple sclerosis fatigue are that it occurs on a daily basis, that there are aggravators such as triggers like heat and humidity. A lot of times it can occur in the morning, even if you had a full night's sleep, even if you got good sleep. 
there's a sudden onset of it where it'll come on really swiftly. It can worsen throughout the day, so you'll become progressively more fatigued as the day goes on. And it really is more severe than normal fatigue. It's not just, oh, you're a little tired. It's very, very noticeable in these patients. So it can actually have a very high impact on the patient. It can interfere with their activities of daily living. If you don't have the energy to perform the necessary tasks that you need to do, such as eating, bathing, even getting out of bed and walking to the refrigerator to make breakfast in the morning. It can start giving patients depression or depressive symptoms. They'll be unmotivated and due to the fatigue, they really won't enjoy the things that they'd enjoyed before. And it can help, it can have patients have trouble holding a job. Basically they'll, as you can see in the picture, they're really just struggling to get through the work day due to that fatigue, really struggling to do the things that they are normally accustomed to doing. And it can even have problems in, with relationships where you're, you're due to your fatigue, you're having trouble maintaining those person to person relationships that you once had. So there is a lot of different types of management for this fatigue, and I'm going to be going over non pharmacological management first. Occupational therapy with an occupational therapist can help to simplify tasks can help to streamline the patient's activities of daily living. Physical therapy can be a big plus and can help exercise, like with exercise programs, it can help strengthen the patient, it can help work on those movements with general strengthening, aquatic therapy, things like Tai Chi and yoga. Sleep regulation can be helpful to make sure the patient isn't sleepy all the time, it can help normalize that circadian rhythm. Stress management, relaxation training and support groups can really help with the psychological aspect of it. Uh, the depressive symptoms that kind of come along that can cycle back into the fatigue. And heat management strategies can also be important to avoid overheating, which is a common trigger for MS fatigue. Now we're gonna get into some of the pharmacological options that we have to treat MS and MS fatigue. So there's currently no medications approved specifically to treat MS fatigue, but we do have other therapies that prescribers use to help combat these symptoms. They're all currently used off label and they include drugs like mantidine, stimulants, and antidepressants. First off, we're going to get into amantadine. Uh, amantadine is the first medication used to treat MS fatigue and the most widely studied. It's FDA approved for the prophylaxis of influenza and symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's disease, but we have found evidence that it can also assist in treating MS fatigue. The mechanism of how it treats MS fatigue is unknown, but there are certain uh, possible mechanisms that have been theorized, including anticholinergic properties, changes in dopamine release in the striatum, and it also blocks NMDA glutamate receptors. It has modest efficacy in reducing the day-to-day -day symptoms and a relatively low side effect profile with pretty non-severe symptoms in the grand scheme of things like nausea and dizziness. Next, we're going to get into stimulants. Stimulants are energy boosters. However, the problem here is they don't treat the underlying cause. And they're simply just used to try and reverse fatigue. And also SNRIs are used. They're not necessarily stimulants, but because of the norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, they have stimulant-like properties. So in terms of stimulants, we have methylphenidate, dextroamphetamine, armodafinil, modafinil, and SNRIs like lumonazepran, venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, and duloxetine. It's important to know, however, that these stimulant medications are controlled substances and can be difficult to get access to sometimes. Next are antidepressants. Antidepressants try and deal with the psychological burden from MS. As we said earlier, 54% of MS patients have diagnosed depression. This depression can lead to low energy that further exacerbates MS fatigue symptoms. What we use here, we use tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, and other drug classes like SNRIs and dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So some examples of these are listed below in terms of TCAs, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, a few others, SSRIs, sertraline, fluoxetine, citalopram, 
escitalopram. And then our other drug classes like mirtazapine, belazidone, fortioxetine, and bupropion. Finally, we're going to get into more pain in MS. 75% uh, of MS patients experience pain. It's uh, neuropathic pain, and it can also be secondary to fatigue. So MS patients experience four different types of pain. They have continuous central neuropathic pain, intermittent central neuropathic pain. So we're talking uh, headaches, skeletal pain, all of this stuff, musculoskeletal pain, and mixed neuropathic and non-neuropathic pain. So it's really not just one mold that this pain fits into. It can affect the nerves, it can affect the muscles, and you can have a mixer of both. And how we treat this, we use tricyclic antidepressants, baclofen, uh, cannabinoids, and certain anti-epileptic medications like carbamazepine. So looking into the future of how we treat MS pain, there's more movement towards psychological screening to determine the underlying causes if it's coming from depressive symptoms or MS itself, the underlying pain. Uh, there's more effective drugs to treat MS coming out in the future, and that'll hopefully lessen the burden on these patients and make it easier for them to live their daily lives. And we're going to use drugs to treat the underlying causes of fatigue. If we can identify where the fatigue is coming from, what underlying condition is causing it, we can better treat it moving forward. Thank you for viewing our presentation. That is all we have. If you have any questions for us, uh, there will be a Q&A form uh, released and ask any questions and we'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna grab a drink.